Three, two, one. Skibbity dub 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 yes yes. <laughs> Skibbity dub dub e e. Skibbity dub 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 yes yes. Skibbity dub dub e e. That's a line from the upcoming film uh, <laughs> Possession, the remake from the director of Smile. Oh, I, th- <laughs> I thought you were doing a uh, long legs quote. Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Yeah. I was thinking of starting off saying "Hail Satan," and then I didn't. I was got. I've got a long legs one written down. I'm sorry. It seems I wore my long legs today. What happens if I just then it then it cuts? So if you've oh, seen yeah. the movie, you'd know okay. that. That's why I just kind of stopped talking. <laughs> I'm Adam from YMS. This is Sardonicast. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex from IHG. Hello, everybody. Skibbity toilets on the horizon, and I'm Michael Bay. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if anyone's going to do it, why not, you know? Give everyone skibbity toilets. It checks out. It does check out. And it's going to be huge, probably. I mean, yeah, it's guaranteed to be huge. Yeah. It's it's going to be enormous. But the most interesting part to me was just like the... I I thought the skibbity toilet is made in Valve's, like, source engine, I think. Yeah, but I mean, like, that's... Elements from Half-Life. The... Yeah, but it's that's a uh, Gmod is basically something where what was it called? Source Filmmaker? It's assets within Source yeah, yeah. Filmmaker. And using that, I'm pretty sure Valve has always had, they've always maintained the mentality of anybody can just make a thing using these assets and then post it. I do believe that if it were translated into a film form, I don't know if it's going to have the exact same G-Man face. And if it does, maybe they'll pay exactly. some royalties or licensing to Valve, but I'm pretty sure they've got that covered. The more interesting kind of copyright uh, conundrum would be the fact that Skibbity Toilet, the song, like the melody, the entire thing, that like it's literally of just course, yeah. Timbaland, Nelly Furtado, the song Give It To Me. It's the chorus from that. I'm actually kind of shocked that Skibbity Toilet has existed this entire time and not been copyright claimed by Timbaland. That's a bit more surprising mm. to me. But I guess it's something that, you know, can thrive on TikTok, which, you know, probably they're seeing more people download the song anyway. Or actually, you know what? True. I opened up this fucking uh, this music video, Timbaland, give it to me. I was expecting all of the top comments to be about Skibbity Toilet, so I don't think anybody makes that association. I don't see a Probably single not. Skibbity no. Toilet comment here. Oh, I see one. I see <laughs> one Skibbity Toilet. I had to scroll down really far. Holy shit. Is this like a Blurred Lines Marvin Gaye situation? <laughs> I don't know if I would make that comparison, but this is like, I'm I'm pretty sure, I've now I've seen Skibbity Toilets like at least one through 20, Okay. And I'm pretty sure yeah, that same. there's parts within Skibbity Toilet where they actually, it, it's not just a recreation of the melody and lyrics, but they actually use a slowed down sample of the original track. So they're not hiding that it's the original track, even if a lot of people just don't know that the original track exists. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be any like intent that way. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just more like you're bringing up the idea of. Yeah, this is great, great content for TikTok and YouTube Shorts, but how are you supposed to write a narrative? Okay, look, they're going to make it fucking epic. It's probably not going to have anything to do with the song. They might not even actually, like, sing. Mm, Will it be animated? Live action? Is Mark Wahlberg going to be in it? They'll just make it epic. They're just going to make it Transformers. It's going to be Transformers, but with toilets. Yeah. I guarantee you. That's probably safe bet, actually. That's why Michael Bay is doing it. It's Transformers. Like a $100 million, maybe $150 million. Visual effects heavy. The reason why the original Skibbity Toilet is already so epic is because it's a grand scale war battle with toilets. But it's also got the horror elements. It's creepy. It makes you feel weird. It's creepy. It's it's a a creepy series. For children. So in that same vein, Five Nights at Freddy's, it's going to be a hit. I'm honestly kind of shocked Blumhouse isn't trying to pick this one up, but you know. (laughs) I forgot, you know, I forgot they made a Five Nights at Freddy's movie already. Exactly. (laughs) And it won't be the last. Yeah. Meme movie. You know, it's actually kind of surprising it's taken this long to get to, like, the meme movies, you know? Like, there's there's been the odd thing out there, but, I don't know, not with Michael Bay involvement or this kind of 
it's kind of money. They must be, they must see some potential there. Yeah, I think I think probably the fact that Five Nights at Freddy's did so fucking well is probably why this got greenlit. They're like, oh, what's it, what else is a baby property on the internet? I'm just yeah, I'm surprised it's not. I don't know. It's quite an expensive concept, right? Like, you know, in the videos, it's like big explosions, there's helicopters, there's yeah. like militaries and wars going on. Like that's that's going to be an expensive ass movie. So you know, FNAF is like one room and like five animatronics or whatever. Oh yeah, and even if in FNAF they didn't even utilize that, <laughs> what if <laughs> they make the entire film <laughs> in Source Filmmaker? That'd be cool. I would love that person, but they're not going to do that. No. They're never going to no. do that. What if what if they film it like a documentary and we call it live action? They could do that. I think we, get Your John on the phone. Live action. John! <laughs> we got to get John. All right. Um speaking of uh things that we talk about on a podcast, we watched Invincible <laughs> <laughs> season 2. <laughs> and uh you started it before I did. And yeah, so this obviously a wrapped while. up a while ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, yeah, I wrapped up the show as it was live. There was that weird break in between, which kind of like murdered the momentum, I feel like, of that season. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's so yeah. stupid. <laughs> I, I, I still am like baffled that they chose to do that, <laughs> especially with the, man, the pace of the season is so different to the first one. They really needed all the chips they could put down at the same time you know like keep the momentum building um so that's, that's kind of the best thing about invincible i'm sure that decision was made like independently of th- them understanding what the structure of the show was because you you know it, it's just kind of like a uh it, it's just something that you do as a business person trying to drum up more hype for something i guess but i don't think that many people making those decisions are aware of what the actual content is of what they're producing. Yeah, it seemed like, yeah, they're trying to get more subscriptions for just on Amazon Prime, right? Yeah, it really backfired. Just just weird. Everybody forgot about it between the mid-season. Like, nobody talked about it when it came back. Yeah, yeah, they really kneecapped themselves for genuinely no reason. But uh, I was so kind of frustrated by that rollout that I was like, you know what? There's a full, complete, like, comic out there. I'm just going to read the whole thing. So I just got the compendiums. I read all three. So I, I know the whole story now. Like um, literally all of the comics? All of it, yeah. Wow. Because there are what, like, a hun- there are like 150 issues. Um, I don't know, it probably took me a couple months or something. Okay, Reading cool. a few, few issues a night. Yeah, so I've kind of got some different feelings about the way season two sits with the full context compared to how it felt after finishing it now. But that's not to say there aren't some other issues going on with season two compared to one. With the, the biggest glaring issue to me being that the kind of structure of it, season one has a really good first and last episode that, you know, really memorable, shared around everywhere. Two just doesn't have that going on for it. It's kind of put, it's, it's a lot of just establishing stuff, a lot of, oh, the, these threads that seem kind of disparate or like they don't really mean much or uh, no. they're not going anywhere, but. They, they really do. I promise you they do, but it doesn't oh, God. feel satisfying within this, yeah, that sucks. this packaging. Wow. I'm going to forget all about all of it by the time that it brings it back. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that, and that's the ultimate issue with the way they're rolling, how slowly they're rolling this out. Because obviously the animation is so expensive and time consuming and they, they just keep adding the biggest names like in the industry to like these, this voice cast. So the, the, it must be expensive as hell to make. Oh, I'm sure it is. And they even acknowledged that in the series with that fucking fourth which yeah wall which is a joke. reference to um in the yeah they like adapted it from a joke in the comic which was oh, nice. at the expense of the the like comic writers um and th- that's another kind of problem i had with it was that that joke really works on the comic page um in that context but the way they adapt it into animation is like the whole joke is hey look uh, this is a scene with some like obvious animation tricks to kind of prod the audience and be like, yeah, yeah, this is expensive and hard to make and animation is difficult and time consuming with the joke being, look how bad the animation is in this scene. Um, (laughs) Maybe that would hit harder if there was like the inverse of that, like the mind blowing animation and a consistent, like really high quality to it, which I 
it's, it's one of my biggest issues with the show is like that I feel like the animation took a step down in season two overall. Um, I don't remember any scene like the the poses and the action like in the, the the dynamics from that first and last episode of season one. There's some like great animation in there. I just don't remember anything that hits quite that hard of visuals as memorable as anything that happens in either of those two episodes in season two. Um, I don't think the animation was ever like incredible, but it it was serviceable and it it definitely did the job for like budget versus like what you're trying to show. It looks a lot better than that upcoming Watchmen animated show. Oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh yeah, that awesome. one. That one. It's like okay, <laughs> you've chosen an animation style where you don't care about people's facial expressions. Interesting. Uh, what was the yeah. joke in the comic? Um, it was about like panel reuse to like fill pages. Um, so it uses the same panel for like most of a page. Um, oh, it's quite funny. Easy to find out there. Yeah. It's, it's it's pretty much the same joke, but uh, slightly tweaked. Okay. Um, yeah, I uh, season one was really great, and it was helped by the fact that there was like a really easy conflict to follow that was progressing throughout the entire season. It was the awesome dynamic hope, yeah. between the main character, Invincible, and his father, and more things got revealed. You saw the sinister nature of what he had to deal with and it was an ongoing conflict that like was progressing all the way up until the end of the final episode of season one and it left it yeah. in a really interesting place to pick up on at season two season two and i also watched that like in between season spinoff thing like the uh oh the atom eve thing. yeah 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 which was fine i guess but yeah. It was decent. There's some good yeah. animation in the fight scene in there. Um, season two just it uh, it felt like every conflict was being introduced per episode, and it felt like from the beginning yeah. of season two to the end of season two, nothing changed really significantly. Like like you could have just had not anything happen, and like we could have started at wherever they're going to do it during season three. Is how I felt. Like, nothing significant got changed about anything that happened by the end of it. I pretty much agree. But basically, the biggest change is that he breaks up with his girlfriend by the end. Amber, I think her name is? Yeah, who cares? Um, exactly, yeah. And within the context of the full comic, this section of the story is the weakest part. Okay. It is like a, we've got to rebuild momentum after the big events uh, with the the conflict the the big fight on earth with only man and invincible like after that it's kind of a lull and they've got to rebuild stuff back up but the the story honestly gets so much better once this stuff is out the way once they're like i don't want to be severe so. and i've got to juggle this and that but <laughs> i like, hope they, so because i was honestly probably yeah. just not going to continue watching but the way you're describing it makes me feel like maybe i could there it is it one of the best things about the comic at least and if you know if the show follows it well um is that it it just builds on itself and it builds on itself and it's like you get payoffs you get like a a payoff in like issue 120 that like is so crazy well i don't know if it's specifically 120 but that far later down the story you're getting payoffs for things that are like oh i remember that being established in season one mm -hmm. you haven't forgotten that that is like okay wow that's really satisfying really cool this is like a whole grand narrative. You're not forgetting what you're setting up. It doesn't feel like it's wasting time, even though season two in a vacuum kind of feels like it is, or is like, where's the focus? What are we doing here? Like, where's this ending? Um, and yeah, dancing around like spoilers or whatever. Sure. There's, I don't know. It's exciting, especially, I, I think season three, if they do it right, might turn you around. Uh, okay. With the like way it's being paced. I, I feel I can confidently put that down. Um, First of all, sorry for everyone who can hear me chewing my piece of leftover pizza because I didn't have time to eat today, so I'm almost finished. Don't <laughs> uh, Second, with the entire story in mind, uh, would you yeah. still say that season two had way too much filler and they probably could have trimmed it in half and kept everything that they said yes up. yeah it, it really needed a stronger like focus because towards the beginning they set up this really interesting like multi-dimensional hopping villain and then it's just kind of dropped and it comes back at the end but it's like but 
needed more of this. We needed we needed some through line for this season to keep it together. Because yeah, it does feel like, oh, this is a bunch of setup. It's kind of interesting, but man, I, I really want that feeling like the the end of season one. We were like, oh my god, that was really brutal. That was horrifying. Like holding him up with the train, and it's like really memorable stuff. Whereas yeah. I, I haven't seen this like. You obviously finished it recently, but I'm trying to even remember what it ends on. Yeah. Of Levy getting killed by Mark, right in like a, a pool of. Goody. And he's like, "Oh, I'm so sad because I had to kill someone, even if it through self defense. I've got blood on my hands, yeah. figuratively and literally." Well, mm -hmm. and they, then they do and like, like say... ten thousandth song break. You know, right, so we're yeah, gonna do yeah. a little montage over a pre existing song. It's like okay, you know. Now that you've done it so many times, even in the ones that would otherwise feel okay, I'm irritated because now it just seems like you're just doing it. Like, it just seems like a trope now. Like, oh, another song There break. were two I liked. Radiohead. I liked the one of from the perspective of his mother and then, like, the equivalent kind of montage of his father in a different episode. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one where he's, like, looking over space. and Yeah, I thought those were the two good uses of that, but outside of that. Too frequent. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. It really yeah, just seems bullshit. It seems like a, I don't know, a way you can get around some animation stuff. You know, to animate to vocals or specific movements, you can be a bit more abstract. But or just trim the fucking season in half. Like if if this is the slowest part of the story, include a bit of issue three. Like I don't know if they're doing a direct translation of like issue one, issue two, or like how they're doing it. They really restructured. Um, especially the first chunk. Yeah, take a bit more from later and put it in season two. And then don't fucking split it in the mid-season, especially when, like, you haven't set up anything to give anybody any reason to care about, like, coming back to it. Like, yeah. nobody fucking it doesn't give it. you. It doesn't give you a good impression that the scale of the story is growing, because that's another thing the yeah. comics do, is that as it goes along, the, the scale get, is so big by the end, it's like, this is so cool. Like, the the... The progression from the beginning to the end where it's really not selling that as well in the show but again it's just more of a lull kind of slower section of the story that uh will have payoffs that you weren't expecting hopefully well yeah if they adapt it um well we've got a bad track record so far with robert kirkman television show adaptations so <laughs> i'm just hoping we don't get another one of the true i think he i believe he has a lot more um creative control over this one i'm i would hope he does <laughs> after that debacle i think it's like it's his studio or something that has some yeah. very direct he like owns something so i don't know um you'd hope they'd do it right and the whole thing is is complete and finished and has a bow on it so there's no excuse for uh not adapting it well, you know? It's not like a Game of Thrones situation where it's going to run out or... It would be funny if whatever. Amazon just cancelled it for no reason. I've got, I'm, I'm kind of scared, like, <laughs> to be honest. Especially if season two didn't connect, like, how, how many viewers did it get? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm sure it's one of their top shows either way. So how far into the entire comic are we at the end of season two? I would say the to do it properly, there should be about five seasons. Okay. Um, I would say... Season two is like the end of Compendium one of three. So, okay. yeah, about two seasons per Compendium would about make sense. So five or six seasons. Yeah. All right. Well, but it's going to get so expensive. Like, I don't know how they're going to animate some of this stuff, but I want to see them try. You know, you know, there's a there's an Amazon original show called sausage party food topia <laughs> oh yeah i've seen the trailer God damn it. and i watched it and i'm like on, i'm genuinely shocked because you can tell how much money they spent on it it could have just been a sequel movie it's eight episodes they've got so much like every single fucking episode has so much fucking like licensed music they've got the entire original cast back so like seth rogan michael Sarah, really? like yeah everybody like, literally everybody's back. I'm like, what? Really? Like, I thought just the spin-off nature of it, you'd just replace some of the voice actors because you're clearly paying them a lot of money. And then you look on IMDb, it's just like, okay, nobody watched this. As I was, like, going through the show and uh, checking on the Wikipedia, 
it's like whoever was updating the the full episode descriptions like stopped after episode two i'm like wow even the wikipedia <laughs> person didn't finish this but what yeah i thought the whole joke with the original sausage party was like kind of how cruelly made it was and you know the animators in particular so mm-hmm. i wonder what they paid the animators on this show <laughs> i mean the animator doesn't sorry the animation doesn't look as clean as the film but you know yeah, of course not. And even then, the the film looked pretty rough from memory. Yeah. So I guess not like Seth Rogen is just producing a shit ton of Amazon shows. That's right. He's two major and the boys. Ones. He's got something to do with this. Yeah, the as boys. Well. Yeah, Invincible. I mean, he's a producer Invincible. of Invincible. He's, he's uh, a producer of the boys. Producer of Sausage Party. He's a real. He's a Be- Bezos buddy. He's got a bit of a monopoly going on. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. That's probably why he was allowed to do Sausage Party then. That's probably why. But like, did, did he even write? Did he write this? Did he give a shit about so this party? show? Like, it doesn't even say the the uh, the spinoff show. I mean, Foodtopia. I'm talking about. Yeah, like, like I'm pretty sure that's, wrote that's it. his. Like, I'm looking on the <laughs> I'm looking on the MDB and it doesn't even say he wrote it. Like, how can I find that? God, they even got Edward Norton back. <laughs> I'm sure he had a lot to do with it. I have a. F- it it okay. feels like something that Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, Carl Hunter. Yeah, he produced probably. Wow. This must be like a weekend jobby for them, you know? They just smoke a bunch of joints and just say, this is eight episodes of this bullshit. <laughs> Here you go, Amazon. Wouldn't it be cool if food could talk and fuck again and they say swear words and they get eat? Especially say swear words. That's like the main joke. Wouldn't it be cool if food said fuck? <laughs> <sighs> All right. Uh, Invincible season two. Do you give it a rating? I would say like fucking five out of ten. It brought my entire series rating down. <sighs> I wouldn't go that low. This would be more like a, maybe like a seven. Maybe. Damn, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, because I I didn't find it to be, I was still watching it episode by episode. I'm still into like what it was building. It's just like this definitely is not good as season one. I didn't mention the voice acting, but I, I really think it's very good, especially from Yoon in the in the lead yeah. role. I really love his voice work. Big boy it. Steve. Like cut above, I feel like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of putting a pin on in that. If it was like canceled now, it'd be like, I guess, I guess you could just watch season one. I, I'm, I've just, uh, I guess my point is there's a lack of passion overall from season two that has its moments like what it's building. Yeah. But, man. Like, I, I hope they didn't just destroy interest in the entire thing if it does get better and satisfying. Yeah. There's a chance they could spit it around if they do it right, but that's if they do it right. Yeah, they got Foodtopia's got uh, Seth Rogen, Kristen Wiig, Edward Norton, Michael Sarah, <laughs> like fucking everybody. Isn't that weird? Foodtopia gets a three out of ten from me. By the way, anybody curious? Oh, did you watch the whole thing? I did actually. <laughs> Damn, that's good. <laughs> and it was <laughs> it was more engaging than Invincible season two. It was refreshing. No, I refused. Legitimately. To that. No, because it was in the first. <laughs> I refused. Yo, yeah, you should. I think if you watched the first episode, you'd be binge watching it in like a hate watching <laughs> way, like I did. It winds up getting like not as entertaining in the second half, as in like, okay, this is almost just feels like a real show, but still like the writing is like basically like kids' show writing, except it's not for kids. Right. But you the first kind of few episodes me, but... are like hate watch material in like a fun way <laughs> okay like i can't believe this exists kind of way yeah it's irritating like, <laughs> but it, but funny mm. like it's it's i w- i was not bored okay it was it was yeah. refreshing after seeing invincible season two interesting interesting i might check out an episode did you say it's on amazon prime like invincible yes. so <laughs> okay so i got no excuse all right <laughs> Uh, we watched Long Legs. A long leg. There's, and my legs are long. Yes, my legs are long, and they're very, very long. Yes, they're very, very long. I'm getting scared. That's the theme song. Scaring me. You're scaring me. Uh, it was shit. Too scared. It was shit. It was bad. Man, this just feels like what? What did I say? It was a few episodes ago. I brought up the Babadook and described something as Babadooking it. 
feel like this kind of goes in that bucket. Um, mm-hmm. A big hyped up horror movie of the year where the advertising campaign is kind of the main feature of it. And that's where most of the like best creative or at least creepy horror ideas were, like in the ARG that they have people doing and all this crazy advertising they're doing for it. I remember the trailer quite well. But yeah, then you actually watch the movie. And you're like, oh, this so I, it wasn't, a, I wouldn't call it total shit like you did. There were some things I liked about it, but I feel like it nosedives and destroys everything that it set up in the first half and it can't really pick a lane it's like oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna be like zodiac or seven to start with with this serious procedural fbi kind of creepy serial killer thing but and then by the end it's like morphed into a uh mike flanagan like horror movie or something it's like and not in a satisfying way it feels like no oh because you got options you know it's like is this going to be a fantastical like answer to this is this going to be just is it just a serial killer is this a seven situation like how how much fancy are we going to delve into here with this horror lord what the answer is going to be are you going to be a hereditary or yeah are you going to be a silence of the lambs and it yeah it just tries to be both and it isn't very good at being either nope and uh, honestly the big maybe the biggest like oh this re- this now nah, this ain't for me moment was I can't remember exactly how far it is into the film, but it's when Nick Cage is like in the car singing. Um, yeah, and it's supposed to be like this this big moment of like, okay, we've been obscuring him this whole time. Now you get to properly experience him without cutting away. Look how intense this is, and that was you know another thing with the advertising. Like people people are passing out. You know, people are they're losing it to long legs. They're getting so overwhelmed by long legs because of how scary it is. And so uh, this movie rides off of the marketing. Hard. And even then I was reading that the reason it kind of wound up being as creative and cool as it was was because the director kind of asked, can we like not rely on Nick Cage being in this as a marketing beat? So they had to get creative. Oh. Um, that doesn't really reflect <laughs> the film, you know? Like the, yeah. The, the, the Nick Cage to me was so like distracting, so tonally off it felt. It felt like from a, a different style of movie, this guy just comes in. And I couldn't help but just see Nick. Nick. Nick Cage has been great in things that don't take themselves as seriously. When he's gonna, mm-hmm. when he's gonna go full Nick Cage and go crazy screaming, right? Like you generally yeah. want those types of movies to be something like, I don't know, Mandy Face Off or Face Off or like something, yeah. something where there's like a self awareness to the fact that oh, he's a he's a kind of goofy guy, <laughs> right? Uh huh. This. Has this lacks that self awareness, <laughs> and definitely, it's one of those things where it's like even if I didn't know it was Nick Cage and I had no association with him, it would still be cringe. I would still be cringing at that part. <laughs> he's 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 kind of cringe. Yeah, it's not. It's just not scary, is it? It's it's too much. It's, it's not at all. Because at first I did kind of like the obscure way they were presenting him. I did kind of like the opening where it's like oh I put my long legs on there was something creepy about that and cutting when his head just gets in frame and I liked that kind of stuff that style to it there's a, a really thick atmosphere to the movie at least for the first half before it's like shattered it's trying because it's like because I, I was yeah I, the, the intrigue was there for me where it's like more so well how are they going to explain this it's kind of a interesting question mark as to there's a serial killer there are people dying in unexplainable ways there's this main character who is yeah pretty pretty flat and uninteresting um but where's this gonna go uh, i feel like a lot of horror movies fall into this where they they present an interesting quandary but the way they wrap it up is just like oh you've just lost all of it uh a la babadook or something um yeah just too predictable. Like, there's such a small pool of characters in the movie, and it's like the whole story is hey, there's a serial killer that has this pattern to his, his killings. And uh, surprise, surprise, the characters that were introduced fit into this pattern that the serial killer <laughs> works behind. So then when it starts hitting the fan towards the end, it's like, well, this, this is so, this so unbelievably obvious to anyone who's seen a movie before. Like, I'm not feeling tense. I'm not like surprised by this. Yeah. main characters flat like what part of this am i supposed to be loving outside of like a jump scare or whatever i found the main character uninteresting at first and then over the course of the film i'm like oh she's like kind of autistic 
and then it became a bit more interesting for me but that's what i thought that's what i that's where i thought they were going too but i wanted to see that expanded more i wanted to see because obviously her they have to kind of keep her at arm's length for the first half of the story because of her direct involvement in it being so like gargantuan and that being like the way it's revealed but yeah it just it, i don't know if it was the performance if it the way she was written it was very one note to me um even though i get what you're saying i thought maybe they were going to delve into that a bit more about her mother's a major character in the movie and if that was going to be partially why she carries herself the way she does or i don't know there was something i was missing from that that performance or at least the way it was written yeah there's yeah i mean like it tries to have a style which is good the, the cinematography is good for the most part mm -hmm. there's some really 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 bad child acting <laughs> and of course they do the whole lazy route with yeah. child acting and it's like oh they're just they're just gonna be weird and quiet like every child also has mm -hmm. autism in a horror movie i guess like i don't know right yeah and it was still yeah just terrible terribly performed and then like the whole like nick cage's character his whole thing, he's like a satanist it's all feeding into this like satanic panic thing from the 90s i guess it's set earlier in the 90s but He's like, I'm the creepy guy who makes dolls and I embody the dolls with Satan's energy. And that's kind of the reveal as to how this has been happening. It's like, man, I've, I've seen this, this kind of thing done well, this like cults and this <laughs> hereditary link to it in hereditary. You know, I've, I've seen this. I feel like I've seen this movie a million times in a million different ways that are just so much better that already exist. Yeah, it's it doesn't really serve a purpose existing as a film <laughs> and i kind of knew like the marketing was really interesting creative building up a lot of hype a lot of people were hyped for this i love neon you know they produce or distribute mm -hmm. a lot of really great films but also i had the thing in my mind where uh i've seen slash tried to watch other movies from this director and never connected with a single one of them so yeah i'm not familiar oz perkins got a few i kind of knew that this was coming yeah people i don't see here's the weird thing about it so his other movies don't even have like high imdb ratings or anything black coat's daughter 5.9 i am the pretty thing that lives in the house 4.6 right mm -hmm. gretel and hansel 5.5 no, nothing he's made has been like well received but there's been enough people that really enjoy them that i you know word has gotten to me and just been like oh you got to check this one out sort of thing. Hmm. And I've never connected with a single one of them. Have you seen all of those? None of them are... I haven't seen Gretel and Hansel. I've tried to okay. watch The Black Coat's Daughter and I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House. Could not tell you if I finished them because that's how <laughs> memorable they are. It's just the, It was just right. not connecting with me at all. I couldn't. I literally don't know if I finished them or not. And so I kind of knew going into this one, I'm like, okay. Unless Neon has <laughs> some magic powers here. I don't know if I'm going to super connect to this one as well. And I, I mean, like, it was definitely more watchable than the, the other two that I've seen. But just, it really just, it's boring. It's not scary. It's not interesting. Like, maybe mildly interesting at some points. But yeah, as you said, other movies have done everything that it's doing way better and are just more of a complete piece. It really fizzles out. Some really annoying uh, editing choices, too. Or, like, I, I guess just, like, scare choices. Oh, so right, some people yeah. were even saying, before I was able to see this movie, people were saying, like, oh, yeah, it doesn't even... Ha it's not scary in the traditional sense. It's, like, haunting and creepy. But then they do have, like, dumb fucking jump scare moments. They they still do. Like, the doll's eyes opening at the end of the scene. Like, wham! Like, come on. That's, like, one of the dumbest fucking cheesiest, Oh, yeah, laziest, oh, that was... That was maybe the worst um, scares in the movie. Yeah, that's that's obnoxious. That's that's incredibly obnoxious. I don't understand how people <laughs> think that's okay. And it wasn't even it wasn't even linked to like an escalation in the horror. Like I thought, oh, is the doll gonna like get up or something? <laughs> is, is that where we're going? No, it's just never acknowledged. It's just it's literally just for the audience. Nah, it's just for the audience. Yeah. Oh my god! Somebody wrote the dumbest fucking post on my subreddit like three months ago or something. It was like mm. a quote from Alfred Hitchcock. And he was talking about like the difference between showing a scene where 
the audience knows that there's a ticking time bomb underneath a table while there's two people having mm. a conversation versus if you're just watching the scene and you have the same information of the char- as the characters and the yeah, yeah. bomb explodes. So that's an example of, oh, there's information for the audience that the characters don't know, but it's useful and beneficial and adds tension. But whoever made this fucking post like assumed that whenever I complain about something only being for the audience in a horror mi- film, that that's like an equivalency whereas like something like this it's like no that's not uh, it doesn't matter in the film at all and the character it doesn't affect the characters right so in the strangers this is like end, the most yeah. common one that i've criticized this type of thing happening is like oh the characters are just teleporting around in the background they never interact with the characters it's literally just for the audience it doesn't it doesn't add to the scene it doesn't benefit anything it's the, it's the right. same as like this happens so many times in a lot of bad horror movies. Uh, I think Mirrors, this happened, but there's a bunch of them where like the end mm-hmm. of a scene, it'll be like a ghost just jump scares the camera and then is never acknowledged again. Just like, boo, right. yeah, I'm yeah. going to do a scary face of the camera. Like, that's what I'm fucking talking about. You dumb shit. Mm-hmm. Unsubscribe. Mm-hmm. Get out of here. Yeah, get out. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking idiot. Yeah, this movie was not special. Yeah, yeah, I was I was surprised by that cuz uh in the in the ads and whatnot, the it seemed like oh you maybe you understand the concept of restraint. No. <laughs> but it seemed more like maybe for the first like section of the movie there's a little bit of restraint uh, the way they're cutting around things. And honestly, the, anytime it did start getting into the realm of being like tense or scary or have that atmosphere for me. All I was thinking about was like man Remember that scene in Zodiac towards the end where Gyllenhaal's like in that basement and there's, it's like the most tense, horrifying yeah. scene and it's so memorable and it's, you're like on the edge of your seat and, um, Mindhunter does similar things with mm-hmm. tension with, yeah, I gotta finish that. like using this creepiness and this emptiness to, I don't know, it's, it's giving a lot of credit to the audience for the fear, like, and it, it, it's almost getting there at points, but it, it just, just misses it each time. Like early on where it is doing the like kind of cliche, oh, there's something sort of moving in the background that you maybe saw, maybe you didn't see. I kind of like that within do, I don't know, a sprinkling of it. And it's okay at the beginning. And you get to that scene where she's like broken into and the message is left. And it just, it just starts feeling like, oh, we're doing this horror movie thing where people are just, I don't know, they'd be acting crazy. It doesn't feel like it's, I don't know. It's, as you were saying, it feels like more just structuring things for the audience instead of like to pay off a character or a building story or like this serial killer thing is actually going to go somewhere. Like it's kind of a, a mess to me in that respect. Like, and especially on a rewatch, I feel like this would seriously not work. <laughs> you know, like all of my positives were that. Yeah, because it's a, it's a bunch of blue balling and trying to figure out what the fuck's going on which is i mean what the marketing is is like the mystique yeah. of the film it's like you got to check out what long legs is you got to see what the fuck it is right yeah it's the it's the mystery box thing yeah and the the movie i recommended also does like a mystery box thing it's a people just they want they want to know what's the question what's the answer to the question mark and i'm there for that but man i'm not gonna be there again i want to um, know have you ever seen the rain the rain or the ring the rain I was quoting lyrics from uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. That's a good song. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I see. No, that just went way over my head. I'm That's like okay. searching up a movie called The Rain. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake. So, at, can, okay, spoiler talk, I guess. Was the implication at the end that like literally just everyone was possessed? Yeah, right. Like the the doll controlled the dad. And then the same thing that happened at all the other places happened again, right? Okay. Is there any reason why the main character like isn't also possessed in that scene? Like, I'm just not sure how it works. There was some there was some rule with the doll and like the the head gets smashed and this like black dust like fills the air. Was that one of the rules to it? Like, honestly, the rules were just not interesting to me past a certain point. Once the there's there's that specific moment, the tension is alleviated, and then you're kind of like, oh, <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, I can just follow this with the others. Okay, if somebody understands that, please type a comment because I'm genuinely curious. Hail Satan reminds me of another movie, Rosemary's Baby, where that line is, and it's a much better film also. 
Mm. Very True, different yeah. movie, but you know. Uh yeah, very very disposable and forgettable, unfortunately. The marketing was the most interesting aspect. Yeah. Four out of ten. Get out of here. Why was the last act show so short? Or like act three and then it's over in like True, yeah. five minutes. Because it had like title cards, didn't it? And it had like yeah. segments. Yeah, it did wrap up quick. Yeah, I don't know. It was it just seemed all over the place to me, very derivative. I was even thinking of like what like black phone stuff like that like recently you know serial killer it's just kind of yeah just very forgettable i just feel like we get one of these at least a year kind of you know that horror movie that has that reputation people making tiktoks about how the their grandma died when they went to see it whatever i peed my pants yeah i shit myself watching long legs <laughs> um yeah i don't know this is like a 2.5 or two and a half stars yeah or a five out of ten for me um I feel like this this atmosphere and this style presenting a better script could be interesting, could be fun. There's 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 not nothing going on here. It's more like man, I wish it was that miscasting of Cage seems like a big <laughs> a big one for me. And just yeah, all these strands that seem to just contradict each other or don't complement each other. Yeah, honestly, just. I've, really not thought about this movie since seeing it a couple of weeks ago whenever i did it's yeah I don't, I don't know if this one's going to be in the in the history books for like great horror films particularly i mean people will put it there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes it's i mean people it's it's doing very well it's made a hell of a lot of money reviewing well so i don't know we'll get long legs trilogy probably i don't know they're gonna i mean like uh oz perkins is gonna work with neon again and do a Stephen King novel adaptation so maybe it actually might work out a bit better next time okay the monkey Let's or see. something I don't, I don't remember right but again like we've had so many Stephen King adaptations too it's like that's not even a bankable necessarily it could mm-hmm. go either way fuck it F it long legs I'm making my long legs feel short with this one yeah, more like short legs. Yeah. Like a dweeb. <laughs> it's time to talk about it time for my wreck? a sex movie because it's 169. Nice. Yes. And seeing as you mentioned that, I got something unprecedented to uh, introduce this with, if you don't mind. Um, I am so ready. Because. Uh, what this is this is a film Belle de Jour yes. from nineteen sixty seven from a famous important Spanish director who I am not familiar with. Um but if you don't mind, I wanna read um a, a kind of forward by one of the users on the Sardonica subreddit who wrote quite a good like intro. Sure. To this film. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I read that too. And then I realized I had actually seen one of his uh, shorts. Oh, sweet. Yeah, because I, I had the same experience. So, yeah, I, I'll just lead, read it's like a couple of paragraphs. It um, gives a bit of context to this director, who I don't think either of us are particularly familiar with, but quite storied. So, let me just read this from uh, 2.30 a.m. Cowboy. Uh, info about Belle de Jour, uh, or Louis Bonwell. Preface. I'm sorry about all the European names I'm about to like butcher. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a mix of like French and Spanish names in here. So, right. Um, Louis Bumwell is a Spanish filmmaker who, over the course of his nearly five decade career, directed in three different languages, four different countries, and several different genres, but has always remained true to his extremely satirical and uncompromising style, art film as a whole, but particularly surrealism movies that break down their own rules definitely would not exist, or at least in the same way, without his contributions that go all the way back to the beginning of his career. His first short, one of the most famous shorts of all time, and a collaboration with Salvador Dali, Un Chien Andalo, 1929. Um, I'll pause it there, because you just mentioned that too. Yes. I had seen this before. Same. Um, I'm, I, I like uh, Dali, Zart a lot, uh, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize there was this kind of crossover, so discovering this was fun. You can find it on YouTube, and I went on there and went through it, especially to see the 
the eyeball shot that's quite infamous. Um, did you have the same thing happen? Like it refreshed your memory? And it like, yeah. Oh, it's quite a famous shot. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it a few times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what, 1929. So um, it, it apparently pretty much changed the game in its opening minute when Ronell himself sliced an eyeball open on film. No one had seen anything like this for a movie at the time of its release, and it would shock people for decades to come. From there, his career kind of tanked for a while, to no fault of his own, really. In the mid-30s, during the Spanish Civil War, he was hired basically as a censor for the Spanish propaganda machine until he was essentially sent on a work trip to the US, during which the war ended. The fascists took over, and he was completely unable to return to Spain after trying and failing to make ends meet in the America. He hit an amazing run of fairly low-budget films that he made in Mexico, which tended to focus on themes of wealth, inequality, abuse, and female discrimination. What would also become clear over the years were his very strong feelings towards the Catholic Church. In fact, the very first adaptation of the 120 Days of Sodom story by Marquis de Sade in cinema long before Salo actually took place in one sequence in Buñuel's debut feature from 1930, except the abuse is committed by the Catholic Church instead of French libertines, or Italian fascists in Salo's case. Anyway, during the 50s, movies like Illusion Travels by Streetcar, yes, that's what it's called, The Young Ones, very disturbing movie, and The Young and the Damned are all fantastic and very thematically timeless. But it wasn't until the 60s where he would reconnect with his surrealist roots, and we would basically see all of his shades of filmmaking combining into this beautiful way towards the end of his career, and that's where Belle du Jour comes in. Uh, I'll take over now because I appreciate that context that actually mm-hmm. really does kind of package up this director and kind of make you understand what's important about him. Um, of course, me kind of just plucking this from a hat with the <laughs> 69 being in the episode, I'm like, let's, let's find a movie about sex. And I really wasn't expecting something this like impressive and deep and progressive especially for 1967 um, with some of the complex ideas and characters they're presenting. The basic idea is uh, an upper-class woman, a a proper lady, starts having infatuation with the idea of becoming a prostitute, basically. And through the course of the movie is a series of her delving more into her fantasies, and it's a question to the audience whether... What, what's real, how much is dream, how much is fantasy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, man, how do we feel about this one? Because I was pleasantly surprised. You never know what you're going to get from some of these movies like that. Is this going to be something I appreciate more than like? Like, what are we, what are we dealing with here? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a healthy mix of both for me. I was, I was into it the whole time. I found it very interesting. Very interesting. I was never bored. Yeah. And uh, I guess, I don't know, spoiler discussion. It goes in, yeah, <laughs> in a very interesting direction where it kind of like culminates in the end. I was like, oh, I was actually not expecting this um, to turn into. I love the structure, <laughs> yeah. actually. With like, after that first act is kind of out of the way and she's cemented as this, she's going daily during when her husband isn't home to be a prostitute or whatever. And the way it's presented is through it's like five or six different customers that are almost like these little vignettes that say something or bring something out of this character um, in a really interesting way and says a lot about like the these gender dynamics that are at play, the, the idea of sex work and the implications of sex work and the idea of like the, the fantasy and desire and making it reality and who might suffer as a result of that. Um, yeah, I I want to mention the the difference between these five different... <laughs> is customer the right <laughs> term? I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Patrons. <laughs> pa- patron. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they, they really run the whole gambit and explore like the concept. Like the first one is this high-class millionaire man. You get the gynecologist as the second one, which I feel like is intentional. Um, third is a rich businessman who can't speak English. And he has this, as I kind of was getting at earlier in the episode, he has this mystery box and this bell ringing. Um, really interesting, weird scene that is one of the main things that people are like obsessed with with this movie. 
Mm-hmm. I guess J.J. Abrams like <laughs> saw that and was like, oh, hell yeah, that's I'm going to make that my whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the fourth guy was this this duke um, who's like, yeah, he arrives in a wagon and it kind of turns into a, this this weird dead daughter, rotting heart, cannibalism. Like, what is going on there with the, <laughs> the whole gambit of like these customers? And they, they will kind of follow this through line of the, they represent something powerful. They tend to be wealthy. The, the way they speak about women or whatever can be vile. Um, Mm -hmm. but they were all like very watchable and like all very, yeah, interesting characters and all very, all very different from one another. So the things that each one of these scenes is bringing out is consistently like a, a different angle to explore or some kind of concept that's fun to play around with, with the, the fifth one being this this criminal who kind of fulfills the I don't know, she's having fantasies throughout the movie or dreams it's kind of a question and interpreted up to the audience what which way you can look at it i guess but like the the opening scene kind of tricks you with this this corny love dialogue they're on this carriage and it's like oh is it, okay is it going to be that kind of movie i guess but it quickly turns into <laughs> Her getting like tied up to a tree and getting uh, assaulted, basically, and then it's revealed that it's a dream, and this is kind of like an ongoing through line: is these ideas of like, is this fantasy something I want? How far am I going to go to make this a reality? And by the time this criminal character comes along, yeah, it's it's kind of giving her more of the what she might think she wants, and then <laughs> as you were kind of getting at with where that goes, where it concludes with basically the husband husband getting shot as a result of this criminal who gets Oops. too infatuated. Um, yeah, it's like quite a dark place to end the story. It's a, it's a dark film, I'd say, overall. It's what it's saying, I feel like, in the open ending that mm-hmm. it goes with. The, the director, he's, he's been asked many a time in this lots of interviews where he's just like, yes, yeah, whatever you want, I'm not going to give you answers. Fuck you, which I like. It's like <laughs> there's many ways to interpret the way it ends with all these like threads, these surrealist, confusing fancy threads coming together in a way that really kind of accentuates Oh, is this like the point where she's kind of gone? She can't distinguish between these things anymore, like in order to live with this world she's kind of created yeah. for herself. It was a very, very like haunting presentation in the ending too, especially with those yeah like sounds coming in. But it's not it's not coming from an angle of judgment over either for that main character, which mm-hmm. is another thing I like. They give her a lot of complexity with these again open to interpret little flashes of what might be dreams, what might be elements of her past that if you put two and two together, it might help explain some of this behavior or where some of these thoughts might be coming from that she's willing to indulge. Again, kind of complex ideas for a film from 67. Like the way it's, you know, all these female characters, the way they're talking, the way the, the concepts they're exploring, exploring are very unflinching and comedic in a way it wasn't anticipating either, especially with that dialogue. Like after that, the silly dialogue in that opening dream sequence they really turn it around and kind of flex like yeah i think it's based on a book too so there's a lot of oh, like, good okay. concepts and dialogue thrown in there so a lot to chew on mm-hmm. if you like there was a line earlier in the film when uh i forget his name but like one of their mutual friends he's like threatening to tell pierre about <laughs> her secret yeah yeah and she was saying she would like throw herself off the balcony. And then at the end of the film, she's like at the balcony, like at the very end. And I'm wondering if maybe there's a connection mm. between those things. Like we're supposed to wonder if like she she did that or is planning on doing that or. Yeah, because it's a very dreamlike open ending with the. There's like no, there's very little. I don't think there's any like score or music in the film. Um but they do use sounds in interesting ways, like in that scene where there's this kind of uncomfortable jingling of the horse carriage that kind of rises in the background that's uh, 
returning to that opening shot of the movie, it begins and ends kind of on the same shot of this horse and carriage and the jingling bells um, that kind of give you this uneasy, dreamlike feeling. I think starting and ending there is awesome because it, it bubbles up to this kind of quandary of like, oh, this, this disabled guy who has disabled the husband character after being shot a bunch of times because of this whole mess that's been created. Is she going to tell him? Is someone going to inform him? It's kind of this open-ended question that is the, the full stop is that like the answer to that question doesn't really matter because like, look at the mess they're already in. So like getting more answers at that point in the story wouldn't really be impactful. So kind of merging the more abstract stuff with this literal story feels like a good open way to end it. You know, it's like the, it's like the inverse of a long legs where it feels like, ah, oh, yeah, you're, you're playing with this concept. You're, you know when to end it. You know how to end it. Mm-hmm. And it feels like a complete, you know, you're putting the bow on it. Yeah, it's it's something that, you know, unlike <laughs> the other things we mentioned today, it's something that I feel <laughs> like I would get more out of on a repeated viewing. I could see myself coming Definitely. back to this for sure. And, you know, as with anything that I feel that there's more to interpret from, it's not just, oh, there's more there. It's there's more there. Plus, it's interesting. Plus, there's like a reason why I would want to uh, continue going through it. Yeah. The uh, Madame Anaï was a very interesting, great character as well. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> the guy who, who winds up becoming like too attached is like such a <laughs> fucking greasy little anime Jojo villain. <laughs> like, Straight he's, up. He's, he's very cartoony. That but it, coat. With that, with the <laughs> the staff thing with the knife, you know? oh yeah, I like that <laughs> so reveal. Like French, like he was just walking around yeah. with a cane and like, oh no, it's a, it's a weapon. Okay, yeah, that was funny. The the, the criminal as- aspect was like, oh, like, I wasn't expecting to get like any action scenes or shootouts or anything quite like that. To be honest, um, <laughs> and that was one of the things I noted mm. down was the way they wrap up that character when he gets shot and there is that shootout. I was thinking of um, that Loach film we did, where it's like, oh man, you got like an uh, an action scene in here that's clearly not the director's like passion or strength. It's like, oh, this is kind of messy. The audio editing's all over the place. This it's kind of clunky. This this little scene right here, I like the way it ends, I like the way it came together. But the rest of the movie doesn't really have. There's some interesting like cuts and edits for sure, but it doesn't it didn't have anything that stood out to me that was quite that like. Okay, this was made in '67 type stuff Mm -hmm. yeah it was really well shot for the time the only things that i would say were dated to me was like some of the sound effects were yeah really old sounding and also just like the way that they were edited into the film you could kind of like hear some of them like abruptly cut at some points like the gunshot sound effect yeah yeah exactly but you know pretty easy to forgive yeah it was it was really interesting because i the um the way the story was flowing, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually, it's it's unique in handling the subject matter in the sense that, like, despite obviously very disturbing things happening, it doesn't really feel, like, too exploitative. Um, yeah. And it doesn't feel too, you know, explicitly graphic or anything. Like, a lot of things are yeah. applied rather than shown. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the conversation of, you know, like, I wonder how much of that had to do with just it being 1967 like this is this was probably the most you know one of the most like sexually explicit movies at the time despite not showing sex but just dealing with like the subject matter this would be very boundary pushing yeah and even then i found some stuff about the uh the lead catherine Deneuve. in an interview with her in 2004 she revealed that making the film wasn't a terribly positive positive experience for her she felt that the director had been isolated from the actors by the producers and there had been a breakdown in communication. As a result, she felt very exposed in every sense of the word, she said, but very exposed physically, which caused me distressed. I felt they showed more of me than they'd said they were going to. There were moments oh. when I felt totally used. I was very unhappy. Um, yeah, kind of interesting to read. Mm-hmm. That's a while, 2004, so that's quite a while after the facts. I think interviews around the time were kind of the uh, inverse um, what she was saying, because obviously it's like a big, big career uh, film for her. 
Um, obviously, time is going to. I don't know. You can just be more honest, perhaps. Yeah. About what do you get? She was in. Uh, I think that was, was that her in Repulsion, like two years earlier. She was. Yes. Yeah, that was. Um, and she was in Dancer in the Dark as well. Yeah. I mean, she continues done. to do work today. What I found kind of interesting watching oh, yeah, this busy. is just knowing and understanding her as kind of like a legacy actress. Yeah. Seeing how she's kind of adapted with the times in her performance, because a lot of, you know, older performances are, you know, a bit more like stage acty in the way that yeah, words it's are said. Used to. And it's it's really interesting seeing like a, a legacy actor adapt to that and kind of change and uh what's the word? Uh perfect their performance over time mm. to deal with the uh, modern filmmaking because she's still great today but she acts she acts incredibly different today than yeah she did in the 60s so i found that really interesting I mean, yeah it's a completely different time like the dynamics between men and women even are just entirely yeah. different oh yeah than they were when this film was made so and speaking of uh you said the word legacy um there was a part on the wikipedia that stood out to me on legacy mm -hmm. where there was a huge show in the uk called secret diary of a cool girl um based on a london escort uh who named herself Be belle de jour um, oh, okay. as like her pen name um and yeah there was this huge tv series with billy piper um that was huge in the uk which has a weird link to this um it, it's it's quite a it's it's like your your favorite director's favorite film type thing you know hitchcock loves it scorsese loves it um scorsese played a big hand in the distribution i believe of the film like getting because it's very easy for me to find um which can't be said for <laughs> a lot of films from like the 60s or so just a lot of stuff from like before like 2010 pretty much it's like kind of a coin flip like am, am i gonna be able to find this easily or not um yeah so that was cool there's clearly yeah a lot of appreciation and love and respect for this film um, and I'm glad I could see it and respond and react to it on the same level as everybody else. I just, mm -hmm. I, I love when I get unexpected comedy or cleverness in, especially when it's in something so dark, as you're saying, it, it really, with what it's playing with, the the places it goes, the dialogue really does, a, it, it, man, it makes it just flow so much better. Mm -hmm. You know, the, when they're, they, they're talking to the cabbie, he's like, uh, the the main woman is she's talking about she just learned about the idea of brothels. She's like, there's there's no way that that can exist, right? There, there's no way people actually do this. And of course, the cabbie jumps in at the funniest moment, say, I can promise you they exist, <laughs> and this kind of thing. Um, I love the there's like a discussion with the four characters at the table, um, and this is like. I've been mentioning these dream sequences, these surreal scenes. There's an awesome dream sequence where they're at this table. And just like in dreams you can recall, just this quite surreal, abstract, dream-like behavior starts happening. Like the, this guy smashes a bottle and holds it to the main character's neck and they go under the table and the table starts mm, yeah. writhing, but you can't see what's going on. And then yeah. the, the husband characters say, hey, you, you, you look and describe what's happening. It's like a... a I've mentioned it before, but when I love the way films explore dreams and like, because it is such a unique, unexplainable kind of human experience and such a, I don't know, it can be so overwhelming, so confusing. Being able to translate that into visuals and filmmaking it is off putting and creepy. Mm -hmm. And man, yeah, there's a, there's a few good like uh, dinner scenes or discussion at table scenes. Um, yeah, the is that all you care for scene um, where the, the guy you mentioned, their, their friend who winds up going to the brothel later on and even though he was all into this character when he saw her as this innocent kind of untouched thing, mm -hmm. when he finds out that she's a prostitute, he changes his ways on her and it's like, you're not really attracted to me anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I only <laughs> liked you because you're quote unquote pure or whatever, which I feel like. Yep, just feeds into each one of these characters, like the five <laughs> customers I mentioned. Each one of these is a kind of a fucked up concept or idea. Um, yeah. To do with this subject matter. He has, that character I'm talking about has a 
it's got a horrible line where he's like, I love the atmosphere, women completely enslaved. Like, like he says that like verbatim, like as when he's talking about like why he loves brothels. It's like, man, it's like, <laughs> you know, you're not like trying to hide that at all, huh? Mm -hmm. It's just how it is. Yeah, great character study. A lot of great camera work. Yeah, too, I would say so. Actually, there's some shots that I really like. It's quite vibrant. It's moving around a lot, even though it's you know it's most of these scenes of people just kind of talking. There is a lot of intention and like great timing to the way people are using the space and moving around. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of great intention to that. Yeah, it's it's uh, structured really really well from like an editing and you know just general cinematography perspective. Yeah. One of my favorite shots is uh, when she's like nervously or like compulsively like wedging her fingers like in this tiny gap on like the table, mm. just the the focus on her hand to just show her state of mind at that time, which I really like. She, yeah, they do, do a bunch of good uh, expressive stuff like that. Like one of the, is it a flashback? Is it a dream sequences where? It seems to be her as a little girl in a Catholic church, right, um, being offered the bread, but the little girl is she's kind of shaking her head and doesn't want to open her mouth, which is like quite a mm. quite an expressive like visual with no words being communicated. It's like, oh, that's definitely spliced in there with intention, and you're supposed to <laughs> take away something from that, and the implications are like heavy, and the way it's affecting the character now, and the way it all like links together is. That's what I'm saying. It's like quite a complex character we're dealing with at the heart of this. Yeah. Very. It has to be complex. Otherwise, it wouldn't be interesting <laughs> if it was just like too straightforward. Like that's the intrigue. Yeah. And stuff like, yeah, like the lack of music, I feel like really helps with that. Oh, yeah. I f yeah. Thanks you know, for mentioning like if, that. If it had a big corny saccharine score, like, yeah. man, it would really undercut. The The lack of music is like one of the parts about it that really helps my experience is is that it's not like explicitly telling you how to feel about a certain scene because it's dealing with a yeah. lot of like weird complicated shit exactly and it avoids it trying to be too like big or yeah all these weird like role play fetish scenes which is like <laughs> you don't yeah. expect to see in a movie in 67 especially no that's that's yeah that's what Delving i'm saying into this whole like you are going to be my dead daughter. <laughs> uh-huh. And that he doesn't even really particularly want to touch her. And he's yeah. like jerking off under the <laughs> Yeah, that's coffin. some some it's everybody's like, got a weird fucking thing. Maybe not everybody. <laughs> oh and yeah, and the like dominatrix scene where he's like, No, you 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 suck at being a dominatrix. Go and get my regular, like get out yeah. of here. Like <laughs> I want Steppy. That was the gynecologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he he has this suitcase, and it's like an entire arsenal of just like all these different roles. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, am I gonna be doctor? Am I gonna be the bellboy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. It is fun. It's, it's unique. And a lot of movies, like even today, are just like afraid of showing these types of things, right? Just out of fear that they're showing something like either too explicit or too like complicated. Just making True. people uncomfortable. Um, yeah. Yeah, that explicit nature, the the taboo subject matter. Um, just being so so open and honest about the, mm -hmm. these, like, exploring fetishes even for a film from 67. It's got that X rating. Uh, but you don't, yeah, you don't really see much nudity or any, as you're saying, like direct sex scenes is mostly implied. And I, I love it that way, to be honest. That's, I wouldn't have it any other way. I feel like it explores the sexual themes very well without needing to go beyond some what, minor nudity which well there's nothing for a french film <laughs> mm -hmm. really um what do you think is uh, what do you think is overall saying um geez to you i i don't know if i'm prepared to like know if there's like <laughs> an explicit message that i'm supposed to get out of it there's not it's it's very like open for interpretation um, yeah and the yeah what you can interpret from it is uh, yeah it's open um i did like how the film began and ended with the same line as well that line being what are you thinking about 
how do you say her name? Severine. I forget her um, name. Hold on. <laughs> so it's just how you s- Severine. I don't know how you say it. Um, <laughs> just the main character's name. Severine. With the idea, Severine. Uh, yeah, with the idea being what you're thinking about, kind of making you think like feeding into the fancy idea, the dream, the. This is from her perspective. How much is she an unreliable narrator? There is a part where she randomly does have narration on that scene on the beach, where she's talking about her inner conflict. And I think it's the only scene that has narration in the entire movie. There's a bunch of stuff like that. And it's, I'm with you. There's, there's clearly a lot of intent to it. And yeah, I haven't fully broken it down or got an ultimate interpretation of, oh, that's the answer to this or anything. But my mind is racing, and that's usually a good sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? true all right uh eight out of ten for me i was debating between a seven and eight i think this conversation solidified it oh well yeah this this was a strong eight for me yeah yeah full stuff for me um quite surprised and intrigued by other films from this filmmaker because that's quite a backstory in history there um especially with these well, these kind of, I, I was thinking about like horror movies a lot, even though I wouldn't call this a horror movie really in any way. For some reason I was, I was thinking about like possession and these weird like antichrist or even birth. I was thinking about where it's more just playing with, yeah, unreliable, fantastical, what is going on here? Like what is real? Even like poor things with the, the sex work kind of angle and the, mm-hmm. the, the women main characters and exploring. The, the the female perspective um yeah really unique really ahead of its time i feel like check it out check it out check it out check it out all right question time oh yeah <laughs> let's do some questions then from the sub donacast community head over to the suggestion thread over on the <laughs> subreddit to leave <laughs> yes, for future episodes. <laughs> um, Mushroom Party 52 can start us off here. Have either of you started slash finished season four of The Boys? What were your thoughts? Um, I assume you haven't. Did you Did you stop after two? No, because I didn't even, like, I didn't even watch the fucking spinoff, like Gen Z. Oh, I didn't D? either. I tried. I tried, <laughs> but I just didn't dig it. So I, Gen uh, Z. I gave up on that one. <laughs> That's, that's what it is, right? Gen Gen V, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I don't that 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 is irritating that that exists even to me at all. Like in the boys, a spinoff in the boys universe, in the same way, the thing that we're always parodying does, and the it's like what? It's yeah. such a Disney move. Like why? I get why they're doing it, obviously, but like man, let's get some restraint, please. Um, it's. This is the one that seems to have like broken the internet, I guess, as far as like talking about it in response. I didn't love the way season three kind of wrapped up. It was like muddy and messy and it felt like this show needs to end with season four or season five. Like they're running out of steam. This isn't an invincible situation where you have a good model to build this off already. Like I've, <laughs> I've tried reading the boys comics. They're, they're fucking awful. Um, oh, okay. Super. Didn't know. Like early two thousands edge in a way that's it's kind of funny, but it's like wow, this is so dated. Mm-hmm. This is kind of just dated and unpleasant. Um, like ugly art. Like <laughs> it's just a horrible book. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's getting long in the tooth for sure. And there are some characters they just they just don't know what to do with. They just don't know what to do with Frenchie, Kimiko, or. Uh, Mother's milk. They just don't know what to do with those characters. Yeah, because there are other other characters when they're on screen, they steal it. Like Homelander carries the whole thing hard. The deep's the funniest part consistently, as far as like humor is concerned. Yeah, I I watched season three, but oh, you did see it was just such a like I didn't feel like I was being gripped to continue watch. I just felt like kind of one of those obligatory like, well, I started it, I liked the first season, so. Right, yeah. And now I'm just kind of like, I, I, I got to be better with my time. So I'm just, I have no plans on watching uh-huh. season four right now. Because even people that are fans of the show were saying like, yeah, it's the worst season. I'm like, okay, well, is it going to get better? <laughs> yeah, the first like three episodes are straight up like, oh no, have they like 
ruin this? <laughs> they goofed it. <laughs> like it it's a, a really bad like first three episodes. Um, just wasting time on these like arcs. Where it's like this. Th these stakes are like lower than stuff in season. Th there should be an escalation here. This this doesn't feel like season four of this thing. You, I feel like I'm being strung along. Can we do something about this? Uh, it kind of feels like an inverse of season three, where I feel like that's that started well and kind of ended on a whimper, um, whereas this starts on a whimper and ends quite well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's just more of a case of like uh, if well, it's like eight episodes. If like three of the eight episodes are like good. <laughs> it's like not the best batting average right now. Um, but man, the, the, the conversation is like really settling on this political thing. The people are like, it's, it, it, there's, there's no longer the satire is gone and it's just, I'm just getting preached to. Whereas I feel like the actual message of like, it's, it's more like a, just a general writing, like a lack of quality with that, that mm -hmm. I feel like is the issue more than like, it's, it's never been a subtle show. Like it's, <laughs> No, you know the, the 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 political aspects in particular are like, it's man, too explicit. It's really not trying to hide it. Yeah, I, yeah, I hear I hear that that's what like people are complaining about a lot. Is that it? Just yeah, I thought was too obvious. It, it, it's kind of it kind of tricks you with where it's going. I feel like for that last episode, I think we had to change the name of the last episode too with what. Oh, <laughs> oh, in, in oh, America yeah. Recently, um, I heard about that, and it being so tied together, but definitely the weakest season. Um, I'm glad they've confirmed that it's ending with five because it, yeah, it is long in the tooth. They just need to wrap it up. Um, and they know that the show is Homelander and they can't deal with him without ending the show. Um, so they have just strung it out. So, okay. <laughs> I really would <laughs> that not. That sounds lame. Yeah. It's not going to win you over. That's for damn sure. Um, but. I, I have to. I'm going to move change question now to this one from the backwards man because uh, I want to make sure I get this one in. Because I'm curious your thoughts on it. Um, it was recently discovered that multiple companies, including Apple, have been using the transcripts of thousands of YouTube videos without permission to train AI. An article from Proof News goes over this and also includes a search feature to search for creators whose videos whose videos have been used. The search shows that videos from both of your main channels are among them. Nice. I was wondering what your thoughts. Uh, on this were. I will send you a link to this article because it is interesting. Okay. And I, I did search up both our channels and got these really random lists of these fucking videos. Um, so I'll, I'll do mine first. Um, I'll send you it on t Telegram. Um, so the, the results I got, I hate YouTube, I hate memes, <laughs> date, epic, and disaster movie, the not DreamWork collection, I hate hunt down the Freeman, the 100 worst YouTube channels, I hate Tumblr and I hate 4chan. Those are the ones that were dinged for me. Where do I find them? Uh, go on to the link I sent you and embedded in the page is a... Oh, here we go. A, a search function, yeah. Um, do you want to read your ones? Because they're quite, they're quite funny. <laughs> quite random. I mean, yeah, they are quite random. <laughs> a bunch, like, they're not even my biggest videos. My Patreon update no. <laughs> from yeah, 2015. Like Blue Jasmine Quickie or something. Like. <laughs> yeah. Call Me By Your Name 2017. My Blue Jasmine video 2013. Top 10 films of 2008 in 2014. My Interstellar Quickie 2014. My Dark Knight Rises Quickie in 2012. My first Patreon thing in 2013. All of my Patreon updates are on here. <laughs> Yeah, that, it's weird that. What are they looking for? Interesting. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It could just be like random. Yeah, potentially. I don't know. I don't know how they decide this. If they probably used AI to find the videos. Um, the There's a funny section of the article that says earlier this year, the New York Times reported that Google, which owns YouTube, tapped videos on their platform to train its AI models. In response, a spokesperson told the paper its use was permitted under agreements with YouTube creators. The Times investigation also found OpenAI use YouTube videos without authorization. Company representatives neither confirmed nor denied the paper's findings. OpenAI executives have repeatedly declined to publicly answer questions about whether it used YouTube videos to train its AI product Sora, which creates videos from text prompts. Earlier this year, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal put the question to Mira 
Marathi, open AI's chief tech officer. I'm actually not sure about that, Marathi replied. Um, YouTube subtitles and other types of speech-to-text data are potentially, quote, a goldmine, Vipra said, because they can help train models to replicate how people talk yeah. and converse. That makes sense. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, they'll just hide it in the terms of service, right? Like we, if you upload to this platform, you'll be, we are allowed to use it for training AI algorithms. That's probably in there somewhere anyway. Yeah. I mean, like it's going to, if it's not good, like there's no way to stop it. There's no way to prevent it. Like if what, who Apple, NVIDIA and Anthropic, if they're not doing it, Mm -hmm. fucking China's going to do it. Like who? It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> like I don't. I find the conversation interesting in terms of like, what does it even mean to like train, right? Like if if let's say like yeah, I don't know. Like, am I allowed to play YouTube video if I had like a two year old or whatever? And am I allowed to use YouTube videos to like help them learn a new language or like like I don't mm. know? Yeah. It's it's like a bunch of like really muddy conversations that seem to like not go anywhere, you know, like all these AI experts going on podcasts and like saying these like doomsday scenarios and it kind of just feels like a lot of like tech companies boosting their stock price by like everyone is investing in it. Um, Yeah, it's already over. Yeah. Already over. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes. It'll be, yeah. it's it's an interesting future, okay? We can date an AI in our phones like Spike Jones <laughs> foresaw. I mean, yeah, you joke, but it's straight up. Um, <laughs> dude. Um, well, speaking of things that are horrifying, CynicDocky239 says, after one of Adam's most recent Twitch streams, how excited are you for Red One? Y'all are planning to cover it on the no, podcast, fuck right? That shit. I'm not gonna watch it. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. I'm 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 tired of watching things <laughs> that mm. I know I'm not gonna be interested in. <laughs> you snapped. I gotta I, I gotta I gotta I'm I'm shifting my focus and my content. If I'm going to make time for like passion projects and things that I actually have things to say about, I gotta start avoiding the new Deadpool. And just say it's mm. shit, and everybody knows I'm going to say it's shit, and everybody knows it's shit anyway. <laughs> that's watching my channel, and it's not really adding to that any conversation. True. And I'm like, just I, I, I'm trying to get out of the mindset of just like covering something because it's a new thing, and that's it. If there's if there's a genuine mm. interest, you know, I watched a really bad movie in theaters recently called uh, Lumina because it looked funny bad, <laughs> and it was one of those movies where you watch it and you're like, wow, it's it's shocking that I would be even allowed to watch this in a theater. It's shocking right. that I'm given given the option to see this in the theater. That was fun. That 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 was a fun thing. And I might talk about it. But I got to I can't just I can't just see every fucking The Rock That's too much. movie when everybody <laughs> knows their shit. No, but this one's different. This no, one's new. It's Santa but epic. <laughs> what if Santa was epic? Go go fuck yourself. Yeah. Jake Kasten coming in there. Let's go. Doesn't even matter. Um, <laughs> oh, it matters. <laughs> it matters to, what is his Netflix? No, it's theaters. I know, right? <laughs> Chris Evans was in there. That's going to be a big draw, right? Who? You know, it's The Rock f- C- Captain America. Oh. <laughs> and I guess speaking of, um, the Bad News Bears 18 says... I remember Alex answering a question in reference to a movie you each think would rake in a ton of money purely from the concept alone, and Alex's response was that of a Deadpool multiverse crossover movie. Deadpool 3 is a multiverse crossover movie. Uh-huh. I need to hear your thoughts. Um, I guess I was right. It's already the highest grossing R-rated debut of a movie ever. Um, it's at nearly $800 million <laughs> as of recording. Oh, wow. Um, so this, uh, I don't know, it's probably going to be the biggest film of the year, right? Yeah. As far as box office. Movies um, are back. <laughs> I th- otherwise, I think it's what? Inside Out 2, right? That's the other. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's past a billion, actually. So Disney's back, baby. And uh, <laughs> on top of that, too, this like really weird, like 
I don't know how you interpret it, like desperate Robert Downey Jr. thing they pulled out. Um, it does seem desperate. Like what? That that's crazy to me. So Robert Downey Jr. is coming back to be the maybe the, the most beloved Marvel villain of all time. Are they, is he going to like wear prosthetics? Is he just going like, to? It's such a weird idea. He's just going to stay under the mask. Like apparently it had like leaked before it came out this news, but no one believed it because it's such like an absurd <laughs> yeah. concept. Yeah, I don't I don't know what they're doing, but I'm I'm here to watch it burn. Um, <laughs> But I guess it's not burning if Deadpool's made all the money. If they just space out their releases more, they'll do fine. I think that that's the strat. It, that is, you've nailed it. Yeah, they they flooded the market. That was what they did. Like the yeah, they just got greedy. They every business minded person always does that. You know, like they just flood it. Oh, it's working! It's working! We're making billions of billions. Let's just go go go! And <laughs> we'll get tired. Of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they tried to see what they could get away with, <laughs> and they found out. Uh-huh. And now they're scaling it back a bit. <laughs> <laughs> then COVID happened, and then their biggest bank, the uh, Jonathan Majors or whatever, that all oh, yeah. like fell through. And I guess this oh, is yeah. like panic. Oops. Oh shit! I guess this is how we're gonna solve this. Maybe nostalgia, shorter and shorter cycles of nostalgia. That will, that will definitely fix it. It definitely brings butts in seats. Like <laughs> just having Hugh Jackman on the poster, I guess is like, oh nostalgia. Now I'm allowed to see that. Yes, it's something I remember. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know, man. Who cares? Uh, everyone cares. Everyone's hyped for Robert Downey. Um, what's he called again? Doctor Doom. <laughs> yes. Robert Downey Doom. The most beloved Robert Downey villain. Doom. <laughs> we can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Well, seeing as we're on this like through line of disappointing things. Just too good, says this. Which director's descent into slop has disappointed you the most? Who comes to you? Who flashes in your mind? Um, there's a... Uh, I mean, uh, what's his name? The guy that directed Nightcrawler? That was disappointing because, like... Oh, yeah. Nightcrawler showed so much potential. That's right. Dan Gilroy. That was a really quick descent. Like, speed run in the M. Night... Like what did he? Oh, it's Velvet Buzzsaw. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. Honestly, the, the fa- it's just Ridley Scott. Oh, owns this for me. Um, I don't because I'm. I really question <laughs> like what. What is the what is the motivation? You know, you you made Blade Runner and Alien. I know you're like happy to be working like constantly, and he is really busy. But it's like, for why? <laughs> you know, like these films. Like everyone was upset about this Gladiator 2 trailer or whatever. I haven't watched it because the, it kind of points to the issue with this guy. It's like the idea of Gladiator 2 is not interesting to me. This chain of films he's released. Like, what, When was the last like must-watch Ridley Scott film? Alien Covenant. Pe- <laughs> people say The Last Duel. I know that people say that. But man, the other stuff is buried around. Yeah. I mean, he's just pretty. Napoleon. He's he's doing the Disney Marvel Covenant. thing where he's just pumping things out way too quick. <laughs> but so I, I just uh, I want to understand why. Like why? It, it can't be financial. Why not? But, but why though? Keep himself busy. He's an old guy. He's got to do something. I guess <laughs> keeps it busy. Yeah, but this it's just a different vibe to like. Uh... <laughs> Are you gonna watch Megalopolis? <laughs> oh hell yeah! I'm gonna watch Megalopolis. I am a fucking hype for Megalopolis. Don't say anything about <laughs> like... it. Don't look anything up about it. There's already spoilers going around. But all I'm gonna say. Oh shit! Really? Is you have to watch it in theaters, preferably at a film festival. You might not get the same experience outside of it. I'm gonna. Yeah, I hope it's a BFI if I can yeah. do. Um Because I am so intrigued by that. That's a. <laughs> That's got, oh man, that that could be a Southland Tales or some, you know, something like this. I've heard it what a, compared what, to that what a story. <laughs> oh really? Yes. Yeah. Let's go. Uh okay. That's way more interesting to me than whatever Gladiator thing Ridley Scott's up to. Yeah. I don't know. It just it just hurts me with the, you know, you, you with the, with the sci-fi love. I love Alien. I love Blade Runner so much. They're so influential. They're so important to the space so it's just a shame that i don't know it just can't 
reach that peak again. Um, I guess it's the thing that like Tarantino is always talking about. Like that's why he's like <laughs> so picky with these projects he does because I guess he doesn't want to turn into that or have that be his legacy. Yeah, I don't know. It's quite a difficult thing to balance, really. Yeah, you can risk scotting it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll s- <sighs> Quentin Tarantino is a weird one. But, you know, if, the, if that's what he wants to do, then he can do that. Uh, I don't know. Taika Waititi, that was a pretty... He's not making, he's not making good shit anymore. Yeah. No, I, I went to watch his football movie or whatever it was. Uh-huh. But, you know, <laughs> even I can do it. I heard it was shit. I'm joining you, man. You got to be like, yeah, you, I don't know what is like changed. Is it just like the last four years and like getting older? And I, there was a time where I would watch that in a heartbeat and like not even think about it. But now I'm just like, no, I'd rather do something else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, Tyke is betraying me over here. Um, yeah, there's just so much to filter through. It's like, I want to watch Shogun. It's like this whole series. I want to see all this stuff that's coming out and it's still trying to keep on top of it like M. Night's coming out man ah let's just relax um oh do you do you want me to do this one from baby satire it was one of the more upvoted ones um (laughs) do you wipe standing up or are you seated while wiping the important questions uh not consistently one or the other. Ah. You you switch it up. Is that dependent on like where you are or just just It depends the, on how many wipes yeah. I need. Or how how clean I ah, want to get. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. True. Whereas I'm more of a seat to myself. I would never start standing up. You got to start sitting down. Yeah. yeah. That's true. That yeah. It has to be that this way. Um. <laughs> but it's not like a full stand up. It's like a squat. Oh, you're kind of almost. like squ- squatting. Half squat. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks for that question. That was that was fire. I hope you got what you wanted from that. Like what did you, <laughs> what did you want from that? Is that what you wanted? Did you, did you get what you fetish. wanted? It's probably their fetish. You're asking us a fetish <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, dude, I don't yeah. That's uh Let's find another one then. Um, <laughs> no Kushin says, what's a movie or other piece of art that isn't your favorite that is extremely important to someone close to you? Hmm. Movie or piece of art that isn't my favorite but is extremely important to someone close to you. Does that just mean some uh, like something that someone else that I'm friends with or that I'm close to really like. Yeah, or like a family member or something. Like, I don't know, my nan loves, she doesn't give a shit about movies, but like she loves March of the Penguins or whatever, you know? Hmm. I don't know if I have a proper answer to that. No? No. Because I don't know, I don't, like, I'm trying to think, it like, if there's... The things that, like, so, I don't know, Gael loves Best of Enemies. I'm, like, not as into it as he is, but, like, it's not, it doesn't feel so detached that it's, like, noteworthy for me. Right. But, like, is Lord of the Rings, like, your favorite? I mean, it's you pretty like fucking it, incredible. But it... True. I don't, I don't look at his love for that and get confused about it. Yeah, but is that what it's saying? It's more like you like it, perhaps, but it's just not, you know, like a synecdoche for you. Yeah, that's, that's like that's something different. That's in, it's in a category where I appreciate that movie myself, but I don't feel the way you do, for example. Um, yeah, but I could see why you do. Um, it's not imprinted. Yeah. Uh, my parents really love Hotel California by the Eagles, and I feel like I've ah. heard it too many times because of that, <laughs> that I get annoyed when it's on. Right, so you turn into the dude. You fucking hate the Eagles. <laughs> it's just I've heard it too many times, and it's not like it, I don't know. It's not, it's not a forever song for me. Yeah, I hear you. 
I hear you. One for me is uh, I know someone who like is obsessed with slasher films, horror slashers. Mm -hmm. For me, that's one of the for me personally one of the less interesting subgenres of horror, despite how much I do enjoy a, you know, Texas Chainsaw or whatever. For me, I prefer, prefer like more psychological horror or I don't know. Mm -hmm. Different avenues to go down. Yeah. Did we ever talk about In a Violent Nature? No, um, but that has been on my watch list. Have you checked it out yet? I did. Is it worthwhile, uh, given that preface of my the way I feel about slashes? It's worth watching. Seems more unique for a slasher. It's, it's, I, I did not regret watching it. And there's things I appreciate about okay. it. Okay. So, yeah, I looked at some of the reviews and it seemed to have like quite a mix of like ratings. So, it's interesting. I don't know. Let's do this one from Anime Metalhead 95. I recently was discussing with a friend about Jodorowsky and they mentioned some things I wasn't aware of and was honestly quite appalled about El Topo. Be aware of this particular controversy and what are your thoughts on it? This is one of those just uh, ongoing subjects I feel like we return to mm -hmm. now and again. The art versus artist, the, or removing the art from the artist. And man, there are so many projects, there's so many films, so, so many storied, uh, I don't know, like disasters or people hurt behind the scenes through the making of this art. Uh, and yeah, do you know about the El Topo stuff specifically? Is it? Uh, I actually went to watch that after um, we did the episode, the Jodorowsky episode. And yeah, I was reading about that. I was like, maybe I won't watch this right now. And I just never got around to checking it out. Because it was kind of, <laughs> I don't know, kind of fucked up. Yeah, so this, the, the controversy is from Hudorowsky in an interview saying that he raped <laughs> one of the actresses yeah yeah i honestly like i just i i don't know what to think about it because the guy talks in riddles half the time <laughs> i'm like right is this a metaphor <laughs> like i don't know <laughs> he's an unreliable narrator though. yeah, yeah. like he i i don't know whether or not to take that literally so I just, I have no idea. Yeah. Or is he just being an out there artist being provocative? Yeah. Because I, like, as far as I know, there was no, like, no one accused him of rape. It's just from, the controversy stems from him in an interview. Yeah. But I think that maybe the person that he was talking about was, like, already dead or something. Let's look it up. Mm -hmm. When did... Yeah, what's the context? She die. I don't have any information on that because apparently she is not that well known. Mara Lorenzio. It does not have it. It does not even say whether or not she's still alive. <laughs> but that was my assumption. Oh my god, it's fairly obscure, I suppose. Uh, there's. I search up her name in the top four results is a post by someone saying they were trying to search for her and there's nothing they can find. <laughs> oh, weird. So, okay. I, that's, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I don't know if he's responded to those comments in, in like a criticism or... I, I literally have no idea. Uh, okay, here we go. On Wikipedia... Uh, burr, 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 burr. In 2019, after... El Museo del Barrio in New York City canceled a retrospective exhibit on the filmmaker due to the controversy. Hodorowsky stated that it was a part of a pu publicity stunt. They were words, not facts. Surrealist publicity in uh. order to enter the world of cinema from a position of obscurity. I acknowledge that this statement is problematic in that it presents fictional violence against a woman as a tool for exposure. And now 50 years later, I regret that this thing is being read as truth. See, you're right. It's provocative I, advertising. I, I just. Do you believe him? It's. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's the the it, the, the controversy it st itself stems from his words. Like beyond that, there like we don't. There's no other information. Yeah, it's not like there's somebody right. So I, it's I I don't I with there, there's I literally just don't know. <laughs> mm. 
and it's straight up not enough info. you know it, it the 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 concept of believing victims seems doesn't even apply here because we don't we didn't hear anything from any victim right. <laughs> so it's like it's it's either believe him in one year or not in another year based on what you feel about him or what you think he might be or i i don't know i literally don't know fair so I, i'm not sure what to make of it <laughs> it's, it's just it's it's yeah, one of the weirder me too to. moments <laughs> Where he just he says something crazy, which he does. Like as a guy mm. that's listened to like a lot of interviews of him, like he's he's said so many fucking crazy things, and he's that's, he's a yeah. cheeky he's a cheeky bugger, and uh, he t- he talks in riddles half the time. Yeah. So I don't know. I literally that's uh, that's all I could say is I just don't know. Yeah, it's so difficult with the provocative artists in yeah. particular. Um, a lot of isn't the, that a weird one. <laughs> That's like, it, yeah. What, what, what is anybody supposed to think about With that? With that clarification statement, that's like, what the fuck? Um, okay. I feel like I'm just as confused as when I started the question and getting that info, but man, if anyone else can find anything, let us know. But. <laughs> Apparently, no one can even find out if this woman exists, really. <laughs> like, yeah. <is> she, <laughs> I mean, she was in the film, but like, no, I, I don't, uh, I have no idea. If she's alive. <laughs> yeah. I was looking for like a, a date of death or something. Because Hodorowski is like 90 something. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, 1970. It's almost like lost a time. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting it to go that way, but... You know, it's... Hussein. Yeah. Madik Smalls. Right, last one? Well, unless you had something else to add there. Let's end on this one. Yeah. Um, from Hussein Madik Small. Mike from Red Letter Media had a bad interaction with one of his heroes, William Shatner, over a misunderstanding which left him heartbroken. <laughs> Do you want to meet all of your heroes, or are you fully aware some of them could be unhinged slash unlikable in real life? <laughs> if I meet a director I really like, well, first of all, I've already met my hero, and he said I'm smart, so thanks, Charlie Kaufman. Uh, second, if I meet somebody that I respect and admire and they're really talented and if let's say they've only seen of me what's like on twitter and just people you know being bad faith yeah. against me and they have an idea of me and they're like i don't want to associate with you or you suck because you said this in 2015 or something i'm not gonna right. feel heartbroken about it it's fine like i you can't expect like i don't know like the the mike red letter media thing is kind of funny <laughs> Because it just yeah. kind of reveals William Shatner as a confused old fart, which <laughs> I I wouldn't personally feel bad about. Like, who cares if a confused old fart is confused <laughs> and old and farting? <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't put any, like, personal stake into it. Like, especially if you're no. already a public figure. Like, you, you can't control what people think about you, really. Well, to yeah, exactly. most of an extent. Yeah. Do you want to meet your heroes? I don't, I don't know. It's not something I really commit. Who's your hero? Much, in, much, in what space? <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's say like the Coen brothers or something. Or like an app or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to. I don't really want to meet them. Um, I would only want to talk to them if they wanted to speak to me, I guess. You know? Yeah. I, I, that's, that's kind of my stance. Because I've had that happen before. Like... um. People who've worked on certain games and whatnot have reached out to me and I've had conversations, and that's that's way more satisfying to me than uh, the idea of the, the inverse, I guess. It depends on the space, because at TIFF there's yeah, like a no. lot of screenings where you can, like the d- director is literally just coming out of the theater after the movie's over in the same area that you are, and you can just like say hi. Yeah, you can literally go straight up. Yeah, yeah. And it also like I feel like maybe it's more approachable if they're like not at a, as high of a level of fame also. Mm. So like uh I said hi to uh Robert Eggers. Oh yeah. He was a great person to talk to even though it was brief. I kept it brief. I didn't bug him. I saw hi to Bo Burnham. He was actually there with Robert Eggers at the screening of the Lighthouse, oh, which is kind of interesting. I said hi to let's see if I can remember his name. Uh I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> Director of Waves, Trey Trey Edward Schultz. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah. You're leaving uh, Waves at TIFF, and 
he was walking down the stairs and I was right next to him on the elevator and it was hilariously awkward because <laughs> we were both just kidding. really <laughs> well, cause I was like saying hi, but I was also kind of like non not intending to, but just like hovering next to him because he was walking and I was escalating. Mm-hmm. And so it was just like this long, awkward, like, oh, oh, I am. <laughs> hey, I like your hey, stuff. Like stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. At Khan, I saw Pong Jun Ho, but I did not go up to him because it looked like he was already being swarmed and I didn't want to be a part mm-hmm. of the mob and have him be prevented from going where he needs to be. That's fair. Yeah. So it depends on the context, the situation. I'd only approach someone if like, I'd had some, I need some question. I need something already. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't do it. Otherwise, um, I need somewhere to go. I'm no good just like on the spot. <laughs> All right. That does it for questions. Let's go. Thanks for the questions. I got to recommend a movie. Time for a wreck. Yeah. You're gonna wreck? What are you going to wreck? It's a classic. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. It's going to pair really well mm-hmm. with the movie that we're catching in theaters before the next episode. <laughs> 2010 M. Night Shyamalan, The Last Airbender. Oh, great film. Okay. Can't wait. It's been a while. I'm due for a rewatch. So I think that'll make a nice little. uh... Mm, What's the thought process behind this one? Well, because we're seeing M. Night's Trap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that. But why the last airbender out of um, all of M. Night's disasters? Because this one I'm due for a rewatch the most. And I feel like everybody's talked about the happening. I kind of wanted to do a funny bad one. And I wasn't sure if signs really like signs would be an interesting discussion someday for sure yeah i kind of hate the village and have seen it recently <laughs> enough that it, like the last airbender is one of the more interesting like failures you know okay uh, have you seen the show duty show i've seen the first few episodes of the show but i know you've seen the show <laughs> i've seen the show i might if i have time watch the like first episode of the netflix one i am um, not going to do to that. mention that <laughs> i'm not gonna watch the whole thing i promise you that um, i might just watch the first but yeah cool yeah. interesting i i have a special love for this film so <sighs> it's certainly memorable yeah <laughs> uh, so if you don't want to get spoiled <laughs> M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. <laughs> Watch it before the next episode. These episodes come out every two weeks. You can listen to them early, support the show, go into sardonicast.com, sign up for premium. It's only $2 a month. Also, patreon.com slash sardonicast. Also, you can just do it on YouTube. Member. Do the thing where you press the button and you're a member. You're member? a member. Member. You can be a member for the Member Berries movies. <laughs> Please, God. Yeah. Very exciting. Very exciting. We're going to watch M. Night's Trap before the next recording. So I can't wait. I'm hyped. I can't. I cannot. This is going to be a great episode. We get to talk about two yeah. films from an auteur. Your boy, M. Night. <laughs> he really is my boy. He's a, one of my favorite actors. <laughs> he is. You love that guy. You're like in love with this guy. <laughs> I am. He's a character. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, subscribe to the Sardonicast Highlights channel also. Happy Shrek 5. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Shrek 5, let's go. Bang.